in a, uh, well, let me say it like this. I, I believe Scripture teaches that it's good to honor people. Ultimately, we honor Jesus. But man, I got to tell you, I honor our worship team. <laughs> they do an amazing, amazing job. And I want to ask you to help me do something. Uh, I, I failed to do this in the first service. I messed up. But uh, I want you to help me welcome. My dad is with us way back there. <clears throat> All the way from the motherland, Texas. <laughs> and, uh, and so he's with us uh, for a few days, had a birthday yesterday or Friday, and uh, we're thrilled to have him hanging out with us. He's had a lot of them, a lot of birthdays, a lot of birthdays, but we're thrilled he's with us. Hey, how many of you as kids, you played red light, green light? How many of you remember that game? Red light, green light. There's so many little games we play as kids. The thing about red light, green light, we still play it, especially those of us that are followers of Jesus. Red light. These are the sins that we don't do. These are the things that we've classified as really, really bad. Green light, those are the things that God calls sin, but go ahead, it's not that bad, it's not that big a deal. And so we navigate our lives often playing red light, I don't do those, those people do, but I don't do those. Green light, yeah, I might do this song, but I don't do those. Red light, green light. And Paul is going to continue to confront how we think and how we live. We're in a study of the book of Romans. And if, if you're a guest today, if today's your first time, we are going verse by verse through the book of Romans. And, and here's why. Romans has been called the masterpiece of the New Testament by theologians because Romans deals with just about every theological issue we could deal with. And here's why theology is important. I know it's a Bible word, but here's why theology matters. When life goes upside down and is wheels off, you don't want to just know what you believe, you want to know why you believe it. Because a lot of times in life, we, we know we believe, like mom and dad taught us or grandma taught us, we, we know what we're supposed to believe, but sometimes life collides with what the Bible says and it feels more like life is right and I'm wrong and maybe the Bible's wrong. So it's important not just to know what we believe, but why do we believe it? And Romans, as well as any other book in Scripture, says, here's who God is, here's who you and I are, and here's what we do about it. And so we're walking through this book, and we've come to chapter 2, verse 17. And we're about to read some verses. Remember, in the very first week, if you were with us when we started Romans, I told you that a couple things you need to know about Romans. One of them is, it's going to feel at times complicated. Paul is a complicated thinker. We believe in the life of C3, the Word of God is inspired by God. The Holy Spirit inspired all of it, written by God through human authors, no mixture of error, but God used the personality of the author, and, and Paul is a complicated thinker, complicated writer, and so sometimes there are verses that are just difficult to understand. A lot of times people that have just given their life to Jesus will ask me, hey, what book should I start reading? I never say Romans. In fact, God used Paul to write at least 13, maybe 14 of what we call the books of the New Testament. Paul is not the guy I'm going to send you on your first trip reading the Bible. It's probably John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John is simple. See Jesus. See Jesus walk. Like John, I can keep up with. It's simple. I can understand it. And so we're about to hit a few verses that might feel complicated, but hang on because we're going to dive into them, and there's some incredible truth here. Romans 2.17. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you're instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of the little children. You're all the stuff because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then, you teach, who teaches others, do you not teach yourself? What, what does that mean? Well, it's important to know when he says in the law, the law, everybody 
listening in the church of Rome when they got this letter from Paul, everybody understood exactly what it meant. He's talking about the books of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament in the beginning of Scripture, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He's talking about the Torah. And in that, there are 613 laws. And the Jewish people were all about the laws. They, they knew the laws. And he's saying, hey, you, you got 613 laws. It is impossible to keep all those laws. I can prove it. We talk about the Ten Commandments. We can't even keep those. 613 laws that they were supposed to live by. And he's saying, you're, you're proud of how many laws you have, 613, but you're not following them. So why does it matter? Why does it matter? It's kind of like if you have a Bible on your nightstand in your home and another one on the coffee table and your grandmother's Bible on a bookshelf, but you don't read any of them. So what? So what? Why, why does it matter? You attend church three out of four Sundays every month, but your children live in fear of your rage and your spouse lives under the tyranny of your temper. What has attending church done for you? But you go to church. And Paul is saying, if you're not actually following, if you're not actually implementing what the Word of God says in your life, what's the point of all this? Like, why, why bother getting up early on a Sunday morning? You could go to the beach. You could go to Disney. There are a million things you could do. Why, why come and spend time, make the investment of your time to hang out for an hour and sing some songs and look at this? Like, if you're not going to do it, Paul's saying it's, it's useless. And then verse 21, you who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? He's driving home a theme that has been consistent. It began in chapter one, and now we're moving, and we're going to wrap up chapter two today. And it's this theme introduced in chapter one, verse 17 or 18, of the wrath of God. And the fact that there's a problem. Now, we all know there's a problem. It doesn't take a skinny minute to pop online and read the news or look around at what's happening in society or look in the mirror. We, we know there's a problem. And he's saying, yeah, we have a problem and we are the problem. So often in life when we have a problem, it's so easy to blame somebody or something else. And, and in these first couple of chapters, Paul is just layer after layer after layer helping us recognize the biggest problem I have in life is the guy I see in the mirror. We know all the right stuff to say. We, we have the right language. We, we sing the worship songs, but do we live the worship songs? Are we preaching things we don't practice? And last week, we talked about how when we judge other people, we're actually judging, we bring judgment on ourselves because by judging someone else, I acknowledge there is a standard. There has to be a standard if I'm going to say somebody else is messing up. So the very fact that I recognize there's a standard brings judgment on myself. And we talked about how we'll be judged by our conscience even, by, by the Word of God. And, and this week he's saying, hey, you're going to be judged by your teaching, by the things that you know to tell others they should do that you're not doing. And, and you might be sitting there saying, thank God I'm not a teacher. Actually, you are. There is somebody watching you and learning from you in life. There's somebody that you're leading. Maybe it's, maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your coworkers. Maybe it's your neighbor. But maybe it's the other parents or the other kids on the team, the other parents at the ball field. Somebody's watching you. Somebody is learning from you. He's talking about hypocrisy. It's the word, it's part of the reason a lot of people give for why they don't go to church. I don't go to church because they're a bunch of hypocrites. Well, can, can, can I just help you for a second? You're, you're, you're a human being, you haven't checked out on that, and there are a bunch of hypocrites that are human beings. Like, church does not have a monopoly on hypocrite. Now, it is a fair label because we're all hypocrites. We all have errors of our lives that we say one thing and do another. We tell other people they should do a certain thing and we do something totally different. But, but there's plenty of that if we look around in all of culture and society. Hypocrite is a human condition. He's saying, hey, you should not steal. 
but then you say you don't give generously. See, hypocrisy is thick in our world. We, we tell people what they must do, but we don't do it. You see this, I don't know if there's been a time that hypocrisy has been on bigger display than right now. In the life of C3, if you're new to C3, what you need to know is uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that we're just not going to fight about that other people fight about. So in all the process of vaccines and masks, our position is that is between you and your doctor and Jesus. And if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask, you're welcome here. If you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear a mask, you're welcome here. And we will not fight about it. And that is our position. But let me tell you, let me tell you what does fire me up just a little bit is when I notice the hypocrisy of certain leaders, especially in our government, telling you you've got to wear a mask than taking pictures where they don't. There's a level of hypocrisy that is taking place in our nation. It's not hard to see. School boards telling children you've got to wear a mask, but those jokers don't. There are pictures of them everywhere. And then they get called out if somebody brings that up. You're not supposed to talk about that. I'm a, it's, it's law for you and grace for me. Law for you and grace for me. You got to do what I say, but I don't have to do what I say. And that level of hypocrisy, yes, it's in the church, but it's in all of our culture. And you can look at it in any area of life. And there's a lack of authenticity when we see that. And people lose credibility when they say, live like this. But they don't. It's just where we've come and who we are, but it's always been the human condition to demand things of other people that we won't do ourselves and judge people for doing things that we think they should be doing when we're not doing it ourselves. Oh, if they would just do that, the world would be a better place. No, if we would do that, the world would be a better place. Be careful about people that walk into your life and start telling you what you should do. They're usually extremely confident. They're often demanding and pushy. These are the people that live the law for you and grace for me. Here's what you should do in your marriage. Here's what you need to do in the office. Here's what you need to do with your kid. And then the other person says, well, wait, but in your life, oh, no, the Bible says don't judge. Don't talk about me. In a challenging climate, steeped in hypocrisy, let's make sure we're not winning arguments and losing people. Let's build relationships that matter because people matter. Whether we agree with him or not, listen, let's, let's lean into who Jesus is and recognize that I am a sinner, you are a sinner. None of us are right about everything. And let's bring a little bit of humility to life, which actually values other people. And let's learn to love people and get along with people and actually, mind blowing, be nice to people we don't agree with. Let, let's see if we can just figure that out. Because in all of my faults and all of my problems and the areas that I mess up, what what takes the edge off, what takes the pain off of hypocrisy is humility. To recognize one day we're all going to stand before God and you're going to find out you were wrong about some stuff that you thought you were really right about. Like God loves New York Giants. It's shocking. And I'm going to find that out. And it's going to be shocking. But it's okay. Let's decide that we value people more than we value being right. Here's the problem. We get so stuck on right. Here's the deal. If you can convince somebody of something, somebody else can convince them otherwise. But if the Holy Spirit of God convinces somebody of something, it's done. So we need to focus on loving people and valuing people and stop trying to be little God in different people's lives and deciding that they're useless, they're worthless, they don't matter, they're wrong. No, you and I are wrong when we think like that. To win an argument, all you have to do is make a point. But you know what I've noticed? There's so many people making points and very few making a difference. Let's stop making points. And let's start building relationships to make a difference. So when it comes to loving people, yeah, we've got to have those corrective conversations. We've got to be willing to have those awkward conversations. But Paul is saying, don't don't bring hypocrisy into that. Don't, don't demand perfection of somebody when you can't even be perfect. Don't demand perfection. Encourage progress. See, our God is a perfect father, and he celebrates progress. Angie and I earlier this week got to hang out with, uh, I don't know if I've told you all lately, it's probably been about a week since I told you I have a new granddaughter, and she's awesome, little Ellie. Uh, Angie nicknamed her Ellie Belly, and I don't know if she'll like that when she gets older. She, she might not. 
She might not like that, but we got to hang out with her. And, and Angie and I, we have four kids, and now we have five grandkids. And, and I'm always, I was asking them this week, Angie and her, Ellie's mom, Ashley, our daughter, okay, I, I can't remember, um, when do they start, like, walking? Because, I, man, I don't know if you're like, I don't remember that stuff. Like, things that I don't need to put in my brain because I can ask her, I don't put them in my brain. I always ask her. So with every grandkid, I'm going to, when, when do they start walking? I can't remember. When does that happen? And what's funny is, is as parents, when our kids, those first steps, when our kids do that and, and they start walking and they take those first steps, we lose our freaking mind. Like we're taking pictures, we're, we're, we're videoing it. Oh my gosh, first step. You know what no parent ever does? It's a little wobbly. <laughs> Think they're okay? I expected a little more. I mean, I was looking for an athlete. <laughs> like, we don't do that. We just celebrate. We celebrate progress. We don't expect perfection. And our loving God loves us so much. He is a God who celebrates progress. Take that perfection monkey off your back. God is not expecting you to be perfect. He knows you can't. How much more does a perfect God celebrate next steps then we who are fallen and messed up celebrate next steps. So let's learn to be like God. Let's learn to celebrate progress in somebody's life. There's somebody that you love and, and they're not where they need to be in a certain area and you've had those awkward, appropriate, loving conversations. Listen, when that's taking place, listen, don't be frustrated by what's not happening. Celebrate what is happening. Celebrate the steps. Parents, this applies to us with our kids as well. Have you ever noticed how often parents are the most legalistic and rule-based and judgmental about our kids? A lot of parents are extremely judgmental and they make a lot of rules to try to protect their kids. And the danger is when we make a lot of rules to try to protect our kids, kids then transfer that and assume, well, that's how God is. must be a whole lot of rules. All the years, with all of our kids, most of our homes, we've had a fence in the backyard. That fence is there not so that I'm limiting my kids' excitement. The fence is there not so that I'm limiting what they can enjoy in life. No, the fence is there. I think about a couple of houses ago, like there was conservation behind us. We saw bobcats. We saw wild boar. Like, okay, the fence is there to protect you. Now, inside the fence, have a blast. Swing on the swing set, swing as high as you want to go. Play in the sandbox, like, have a freaking party. But, but the fence is there to protect you. It is a guardrail. A Ferrari is amazing to drive unless you go off-road. Enjoy the gift of what God has given us. But parents, you got to be careful. Well, if this is the fence of our yard, I want to protect my kids. I'm going to bring that fence in another five feet. And then maybe, maybe that, you know, that's still local. I'm going to bring a fence in. And if you're not careful, a fence can become a cage. Don't put fences where God hasn't. Don't build fences around people's lives that God hasn't. Don't expect perfection out of people. Celebrate progress and enjoy the life has, that God has given us inside the guardrails, inside the fence. And then verse 25, whole reason you came to church today, circumcision has value <laughs> You know what circumcision is, right? If you don't, circumcision is when, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Notice verse 25. I think it's okay to have fun in church. I really do. I, I think God made us with emotions, and, and we take ourselves far too seriously sometimes. But verse 25, circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, You've become as though you had not been circumcised. He's saying, as we approach life and we approach following Jesus, the external is always to be an evidence of the internal. I love my bride and so I wear a wedding ring. But this ring would have no meaning if I were not married. The only reason the ring makes sense is if it points to something that's real. And often we hold on to the external and we value the external. How ridiculous would it be if I, if I loved this $10 plastic ring and was more proud of this and wanted you to see this more than I love my bride and I'm proud of her. But often if we're not careful in our faith and it's what happened, it's what happened in this culture. Oh, well, I'm, I'm circumcised, so I'm okay with God. 
I got the external thing down. I go to church, I'm good. I've been baptized, I'm good. I, I don't have to worry about what's inside. I've got these external things. And notice verse 26. So then if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you, who even though you have the written code and circumcision are a lawbreaker. A person is not a Jew who is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Circumcision is a sign that God gave people. Abraham, God said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to blow your mind with how much I bless you. And the sign of the covenant, technically contract, between God and Abraham is Every male born in your household, every son you have must be circumcised. It's a sign of that covenant. But over time, people do what people do. And we began to be more proud of the sign than the covenant. Because the signs we wear on the outside are what people see. We're proud of the fact, man, I, I went to church, I got baptized. Wear my ring. I, I've got all these things that I do. In day-to-day -day life, we focus on the physical instead of the spiritual. We think about the visible instead of the invisible. We worry about the outward, not the inward. And all of that, the reason we do that, you can see the external, but you can't see the internal. And we live in a culture that is far more concerned with what you can see and what you think about me than what he can see and what he thinks about me. I need to look like... I got it all together. You just lost your freaking mind in the car on the way to church. Like the stuff you said to your kids? Or your spouse? Like if she could come testify? <laughs> but you get out of the car. Hey, brother, how you doing? I'm great, man. Family's great. Babe, it's great, right? It's great. We're good. God's blessed us so much, so much. It's called hypocrisy. We're so focused on what other people see and what we want other people to believe about us. And you know who sees the depth of hypocrisy in our lives? Our kids. Paul's saying that the outward is not bad, but it's the inward that matters most. And the outward only makes sense if it's flowing from the inward. Otherwise, it's hypocritical. It's fake. We know we haven't arrived. We know we need to grow. We know we need to mature. We know we need to learn and we need to live better. We know all of that. But we spend so much time, New Year's resolution, trying to change the outward while God is more focused on the inward. Because God knows when I try to change what's on the outside, it is not sustainable because I cannot do it. But when the Holy Spirit transforms me from the inside out, that is sustainable and that makes a difference that is eventually seen on the outside. Paul is saying you're a Christ follower, but you're unkind to difficult people. You're a Christ follower, but you're selfish in your marriage. You say you're a Christ follower, but you're having sex outside of marriage. You say you're a Christ follower, but you haven't invited anybody to church where they could meet Jesus and he could change their lives. See, what you say, he's, he's saying, doesn't match how you live, and how you live makes invalid everything you say. And you know this. You know it's true when it comes to other people. If you, if you want to get in shape, and the most out of shape person, I won't say fat, that's a mean word. If the most out of shape person comes up and says, I'll tell you what you do. Here's what you eat. Here's how you exit. You're like, <laughs> you don't pay any attention because what they live causes them to lose credibility in what they say. Paul's saying that, that's the, that same thing is true in our spiritual lives. Don't call yourself a follower of Christ if you're not following the teachings of Jesus. What are we doing? You're, you're, you're becoming proud. I'm, I'm circumcised. I'm good. Notice the text doesn't say circumcision has no value. The text says it has no value if there's no reality in your life. So how do I live this? Day by day, how, how do I bring 
How do I bring this passage into my Monday morning, Thursday afternoon? What does this look like? Well, I think to answer that, we have to answer a couple of questions. Is my faith hypocritical? Am I a spiritual hypocrite? Am I the kind of person Paul, the Holy Spirit of God was writing through Paul to back in the day? Well, you and I are hypocritical in our faith if our faith is based on things that do not make us right with God. Like what? Like believing in God. Look at verse 17 again. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, hey, I I know my life's a mess and I've got a lot of problems in a lot of areas and I'm not doing things like I should, but at least I believe in God. I I, I know my son or my daughter isn't living in a way that honors God and their, their life is wills off, but at least he or at least she believes in God. This passage that the Holy Spirit is writing through Paul, this passage is saying, so what? You believe in God to the point that it hasn't changed your life? So what? Believing in God is not a relationship with God. Two separate things. It is no better to believe in God or not believe in God if that's all you've got. Believing in God is a starting point that can lead you to a place of knowing God But in itself, believing in God has no value. Now, I think we bank on believing in God because of the most famous verse in all the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes, I I believe in God, I believe in God. I'm not plugged into a local church. I don't give God the first part of my income. I'm not kind to people that are difficult. I'm not faithful to my spouse. I'm not consistent in my parenting. I believe in God. In the Greek, the word for believe is pastuo, and it, it, it literally brings together two thoughts or two ideas in one word. And in Scripture, when we read the word believe, it paints the picture of a, of a belief that engages my faith in such a way it creates an action inside my life. It, it creates a response. To, to believe is to do something. That's why Scripture says faith without works is dead. But we think, oh, I believe, I believe. But the Bible says if you're not living your faith, you don't. Because what we truly believe, we do. Just believing will not make you right with God. Just believing won't get you to heaven. Just believing won't bring you into a relationship as God's son or God's daughter. Oh, oh, I believe. Let, let, me, tell you, let me tell you a verse that's going to wreck your party. James chapter 2, verse 19 You believe that there is one God. Good, even the demons believe that. And shudder. (laughs) You know what strikes me? Even the demons believe that and shudder. It's not a good response, but the demons have more of a response to believing in God than some people that say they believe in God do. That word shudder means to tremble with fear. So the demons... Like, you know what demons never debate? Demons never debate. They never open their Bible to the book of Genesis and the story of creation, and demons never go, how do you think he did it? You think he really made people, and you really think he took Adam's rib, or do you think it was a big bang? What do you think happened? Like, demons never debate that. Demons never debate whether or not Jesus is actually the Son of God. Demons never debate. They never debate whether or not Jesus rose on the third day after he was crucified. They never have that conversation. They tremble with fear because of how they believe in God. But some people, he doesn't even cross your mind once or twice a week. Do demons believe in God more than you do? We we know that Noah had faith because his belief in God led him to, to obediently build an ark when there had never been rain. See, belief affected behavior. We know that Abraham had faith because his belief in God led him to leave everything he knew, the land he knew, by obeying God when God said, go to a place, I'll show you. Not even gonna tell you the final destination, just start going, I'll show you. 
and he did it. We know that Moses had faith because he didn't just believe in God in his head. He stood before Pharaoh and demanded the release of God's people. He was obedient to what God asked him to do. Our heroes of the faith in Scripture are not examples to us because of what they believed. We admire their lives because what they believed caused them to live something different. They did something about what they said they believed. They lived in obedience. So many people over the years have said, hey, how, how, do I, how can I really know that I've given my life to Jesus? I mean, how, how am I really, how, how do I know I'm okay? And often this comes in crisis moments. They're in the hospital or they're dealing with a terminal illness and the, these questions start to come to our minds. And it's amazing the more fragile life gets, the more real it gets and the more we think about what's truly important. And there are people like, man, I, can, I, can I really know? <laughs> If you were to ask me, I can even take this ring off. If you were to ask me, hey, are you married? You know what you'll never hear me say? I hope so. I think so. Well, some days I feel like it, some days I don't. I I hope it all works out in the end. I think I am. No, I know that I'm married. Did you know the Bible says you can know that you have a relationship with God, you can know for absolute certain that you're saved by the grace of God, that you've received the gift of eternal life. You can know that as much as I know that I'm married. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. Now by this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a Bible language liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected. That word perfected is important. Perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Now notice he says perfected. He doesn't say perfect. He's not speaking of something that is instantaneous. I give my life to Jesus and I'm perfect. No, you're being perfected. This is not about perfection. It's about a process that leads to perfection. He's not speaking of perfection instantaneously. He's speaking of a pattern in my life. Do I have a pattern in my life of obeying the commandments of God and keeping the commandments of God? I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We all mess up. We all have moments that we fail God and we, we fall short. That's all of us. But, but is there a pattern? Is there a pursuit? Is there a default position in my life of when Scripture speaks to something and God convicts me, hey, you're not living in a way that honors me? Is there a pattern of saying, God, you're right, I'm wrong, I've tried to change this, I can't, I need your Holy Spirit in my life, I want this area to change. And we pursue God doing something in our lives rather than coasting in what we enjoy. Is my faith based on things that don't make me right with God? Believing in God, if that's all you've got, does not make you right with God. And some of you, that's why you struggle. Some of you, that's why you feel so stagnant spiritually. You thought, you thought believing in God was the goal. I believe in God. I even pray when, when I need God to do something. I, I try to do some good things in my life. You need to stop trying and start trusting. Because believing in God means I'm going to try more. Trusting in God means, God, I invite you to come into my life. I put my faith in you, and and I want to follow your teachings. And some of them are hard, and some of them are challenging. And some of them, I'm, I'm not even sure why you said some of this stuff. But you're God, and I am not. And so I want to live my life in a way that honors you. And I want there to be a direction, a momentum in my life of doing something about what I say I believe. Some of you, what's got you jacked up is you believe in God and that's all you've got. And if that's all you've got, you don't got God. I know it's poor grammar, but I'm from Texas. That's where we just make things up. Is my faith based on things that don't make me right with God? What's another thing that doesn't make me right with God? (laughs) Bible knowledge, biblical knowledge. These are the people who know all the answers. These these are the people that live Bible trivia out loud. You're in a community group and somebody says, oh, that verse in Matthew just means so much to me where it says God will work all things out for the good. This is the person sitting over the corner that goes, (laughs) you idiot, that's in Romans, not Matthew. You can know the Bible, but if you don't know God, people won't want to know you. 
These are the people that God says, hey, they know their Bible. They, they know a lot of Bible. They just don't know how to love their wives or raise their kids or exercise self-control. These are the people that know their Bible, but they don't live their Bible. You see this a lot. You see this a lot with, with end times theology, eschatology, the, the, the theology about what's going to happen at the end of the world and what God's going to do. And, and I've seen people over the years get so caught up. Are, are you pre-mill or post-mill or ot mill? And if you don't know what that means, you'll be fine. We'll talk about it later sometime. But, but there are people that get so caught up. When is Jesus coming back? And they get so caught Listen, 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 listen. If you believe we're close to the end of the world and you think Jesus is about to come back, why the heck aren't you inviting everybody that doesn't know Jesus to meet Jesus? You've gotten so caught up in what you know and what you can explain and what an expert you are about a certain kind of theology that, man, you are the stuff at a basket of tricks. You think you've got it all down, but you don't give a rip about people that are going to split hell wide open if you're right. I know of a dad who sat down with his adult daughter to tell her all about the end of the world and what was going to happen and all of his beliefs and philosophies and he was pontificating about his expertise and what it all meant and what the Bible says all the while living with and having sex with a woman he's not even married to. And see, here's the problem, church. The world sees our hypocrisy. Whatever your issue is that you're so right about, you know what they notice? all the stuff that we're wrong about and we don't care. And we don't do anything. To, we want other people to change their lives. One of the craziest things about church people is we expect people that don't know Jesus to act and live and vote like they do. And they see all the flaws in our lives. These are the people that often have significant areas of sin in their life, but because they know their Bible better, they think they're better. It does not impress God to study his word so hard while obeying it so little. Knowing more about the Bible without obeying it is worthless. And knowing more Bible without obeying it is dangerous. John 13, 17, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. That verse does not say, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed. It says you'll be blessed if you do them. And then Hebrews 10, 26, if we deliberately keep on sinning, I know what God's word says, I'm going to do this anyway. I know what God's word says. I'm going to live like this anyway. If we deliberately, on purpose, intentionally keep on sinning, after we've received knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left. See, believing in God and knowing the Bible are great things. Like, I'm a fan. I'm in the club. They're great things. But they don't by themselves make me right with God. Without obedience, they are pointless. God has given you and he's given me an opportunity to live an incredible life. And God's purpose for your life, God's purpose for my life, if we could see it all, would blow our minds. God wants you to live an amazing life. All you've got to do is open the door to it. And the door that swings to the great opportunity God created you to live, it swings on a little bitty hinge called obedience. The whole purpose of this, like why why we come, While we're a part of a church, Paul is saying, if I'm a Christ follower, the pattern of my life should reveal that. Not out of perfection, but out of pursuit. What I do, who I am on the outside is being changed by who I am on the inside. And that transformation happens through obedience. Paul is saying, notice what you're doing on the outside. It matters, but it's not your focus. Focus on the inside. So for some of you, you may believe in God, but do you know God? Do you you really know God? Do you have a personal, intimate relationship with God? If your heart were to beat its last time today, would you open your eyes in the presence of God in heaven? Are you 100% sure? If not, you may believe in God, but wouldn't you like to know God? You may know your Bible, but do you know God in a personal way? For some of you today, you need to truly, genuinely commit your life to Jesus and ask God to come into your life and forgive your sin and cleanse you and live inside you and be your Lord. That means be your guide through life. And Jesus, as best I can, I'm going to follow what you teach and I'm going to mess up. And when I do, thank you for grace and mercy, but, but I'm going to get back up and I'm going to continue to pursue you. I want to live my life in a way that honors you. I want to build a relationship with you. I don't want to just know about you. I want to know you. 
Some of you today, that's your next step. And that's what will make the stagnancy of what has been your spiritual life fade and you'll come alive spiritually. For some of you, it's what will make the doubt fade because you'll be able to always point back to a day that you know for sure, here's what I did. I committed my life to Christ. Others of you, what's your next step? For some of you, it's baptism. Paul would say, you're, you're, you're living as a hypocrite and you're losing credibility with people you try to share your faith with because you gave your life to Jesus, but you've not done the very first thing he asked you to do to be baptized. And he's not going to show you the second or the third or the fourth until you're willing to say yes to the first. For some of you, it's baptism. That's the next step. For some of you, it's sharing your faith and inviting people. Man, every week there should be an opportunity to say to somebody, hey, I I don't know about you, but man, I, I go to C3 Church and I love it. If you don't have a church, I think you would love it too. You should just try it once. You never know how God's going to use that. For some of you, your next step is tithing. It's tithing. Your next step is to put Jesus first financially. Oh, I'm a Christ follower. Well, the scripture says that if you're a follower of Jesus, the first 10% of your income belongs to the local church. You bring it to the local church. And if you're not doing that, scripture goes as far as to say you're robbing God. And you're living your life spiritually anemic and wondering what's wrong. It's a lack of obedience. And listen, listen, listen. If you're a guest or you're new to C3 and you think I'm trying to manipulate you or I'm trying to convince you, if you think we're all about money, no. This is about what I want for you, not from you. If you think that, tithe to a different church. You can still come here. But man, step, where is it in your life that Paul would say, really, the Holy Spirit of God would say, hypocrite. You're hurting your influence. You're damaging your credibility. You're impacting your family. You're teaching your kids, don't obey God, just say you believe in God. Well, man, I I just don't know if I can't. Listen, do you really think a God who cannot get you to your next paycheck can get you to heaven? Do you really think a God cannot help you heal your marriage and heal your marriage? Do do you you think if, if, if God can't do that, he can get you to heaven? It's the one area of Scripture that God says, test me. So may, maybe for you, man, you need to tithe. That's your next step. That's, you need to put God first financially and see what it is to live on 90% of your income blessed by God rather than living on 100% of your income, trying to navigate it yourself, and according to Scripture, cursed by God. And what blows my mind, we're in church, I'm just going to say this, and it's already, like, I've already gone over, so what the heck, one more minute won't hurt. But, but I meet people all the time that are church people that do spiritual gymnastics, twisting around the Word of God, trying to excuse why they don't tithe, and spend more energy trying to excuse something away, and proving by doing it, you don't know your Bible. Jesus and Matthew endorsed the tithe. Like, there's no, there's no, because it's not a money issue, it is a heart issue. It's what Paul is trying to say, don't be a hypocrite. If you say you trust Jesus, trust Jesus. If you say you follow Jesus, follow the teachings of Jesus. Because when we say yes to God, we invite the best from God. It is our obedience that brings growth and transformation, the growth and transformation that we crave. And you won't live the life that you'd love to live unless you say yes to whatever God is asking you to do. That next step. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for the reality of your love and grace and mercy. God, I pray now your Holy Spirit would have a freedom to move in each of our hearts in this moment. With heads bowed and eyes closed, is your next step that you need to truly commit your life to Christ today? You've believed in God, but you don't know God. And today, you want to invite him to be your Savior. You want to invite Jesus into your life. You want to begin a personal, intimate relationship with the living God. If that's where you are, I want to invite you to pray a very simple prayer. You can pray it out loud or you can pray it in the quietness of your heart. But you just pray this prayer. Dear God, I know that I need you. Please come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Help me to live for you. As best I know how, I commit my life to you to begin a relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 